say the word in their ears like say the word in their bones right every start and and hangs on your voice for you never reach
Lies beyond the stars, those dazzling hearts too fast to grasp. I've got so hard to fall so far, but I found heaven as love swept.
All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So glad that you are here. If you are a guest with us, we just want to give you a special welcome. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Hopefully we were able to catch you on your way in and get to know you and connect with you and give you a gift. If not, you can turn on your hazard lights and we would still love to come and connect with you and give you a gift. If you are joining us for the first time online, we would love to know that you are here with us too. You can click on a little first time guest button on our website. Give us some information. We would love to connect with you and get to know you more. If you um, are coming in, you got a little packet that should have some worship lyrics in it um, so that you can join us along in song. You can find that right now. Take a minute to get yourself settled and find those lyrics. You can also get to the lyrics for the worship songs on our app, our KACC app, and on our website, kacc.church. So if you're joining us from home, you can use the app or our website to find the lyrics so that you can and sing along, sing it out with your heart, know all the words. Well, we have a couple things going on that I would love to tell you about. Um, on August 23rd, we have two things happening. One of them is we're going to be doing a baptism celebration service. So if you are following Jesus and you haven't yet been baptized or you've just recently decided to follow Jesus, we would love to get to know you a little bit, to connect with you so that we can get you involved in that and we can celebrate with you for baptism on that weekend. So you can share that information with us, call our office email us on the website. You can also text the number 31996. You text the word belong. Um, you're going to belong to Jesus, and we want to know about that, so you can text that number as well. Also on that same day, we are going to be doing an all-in brunch. And this is for anyone who's new with us. If you want to get to know a little more about who we are as a church, get to know our staff a little bit, what we stand for, what we believe in, we would love to invite you to come to that. We're going to be doing that with all of the safety precautions necessary, just like restaurant style. It'll be outdoor seating and with space in between and lots of cleaning and packaged food that's not being handled by a lot of people. So we would love to invite you to come and join us for that as well. So make sure you let us know. You can, again, email. You can um, text the number 31996 with belong. You can call our office, whatever you want to do. We would love to invite you to come and join us for that. So for on campus, if you are here, and you need to step out of your car, please be sure that you're wearing a mask. We do have a restroom available that is around this area, past the tree and down in our other building. Um, so you are welcome to use that restroom. If you need to turn on your car so that you can get your air conditioning running once the sun comes out all the way, you may need to do that. You can tune your radio station into 88.3. Yes, 88.3, and you can hear uh, the service through your radio as well. So let's get ready to worship.
to him in his glory alone. We are singing all for his glory. It's all, all of this for your glory. Sing that with us. All, all of this for your glory. All, all of this for your glory. All, all of this for your glory. For wherever you're at, let's sing.
We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence, your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Amen. We are so thankful for the presence of God. You've been honking, amen. We love to proclaim the presence of God because His here Spirit is with us right now here in the parking lot and with you who are online and home. We thank you so much because whether you're here at the church or in your home, God's presence is awesome. His Holy Spirit is wanting to minister to you, to encourage you, to guide you, to uh, convict you what is right and true. And we get to proclaim that. We proclaim that here. And one of the other things we get to proclaim is what God does for us. We come to this time of communion because the Apostle Paul said, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. We get to announce, we get to declare that is our hope. You know, we get to boast about that. What do you boast about? You think about your week, you think about what you do. Hey, I got a raise. This something this happened in my life. I got a new job or I, you know, got these benefits. What do you boast about? But we get to boast about the death of Jesus Christ as the answer for our sin. In Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, the Lord says, Do not let the wise boast of their wisdom. Sometimes we're tempted to do that, aren't we? Or the powerful to boast in their power. Or the rich to boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and that I and that I understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love, who brings justice and righteousness to the earth, and that I delight in these things. Is your boast today in the fact that you know the God who loves you? Man, our boast is in the fact that we know the true God who entered this earth in the flesh, who said, I love you enough that I'm going to pay for your sin. So when we come to this time of communion, we're saying, God, I am so thankful. I am proclaiming, I am announcing to, to this world what you did for me that nobody else can do. So as we go into this time of reflection, I want you to just proclaim and announce and praise God for what he's done, for when he stepped in for you, when he stepped in to take your place so that you can have presence with him all the time. Humbly reflect on that as this song plays over you. Give your praise to him, and after the song is over, we'll come back and take the elements proclaiming his death is the answer for our sin.
you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do oh I just want you God, we thank you for the holy moments that we get to have in your presence. We thank you that we get to proclaim you as the answer for our life, for our sin, for our hope. And if you're ready to declare that Jesus Christ is your answer, let's take these elements together. Lord, we love you. We proclaim you in our hearts. You are our King. You are our Savior. And that's why we pray in your name. Amen. And God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath. stars were made to worship so I can see a heart in everything you made every burning star a signal fire of grace if creation sings your praises so
so much even the rocks and the hills cry out and the mountains display your splendor and the oceans declare your glories and even a hill that you created you came down in the light of the world came down into darkness to die for us and as creation cries out as you sacrificed your life for us a hundred billion billion failures disappear so how could we not sing out with all creation what you have done for us Lord you in your glory everything that we just described is yours and it's all for your glory. So as they cry out, so will I, so will we, Lord. We love you and we sing to you in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for singing with us, church. Look forward to hearing the message. Thank you, worship team. That was extraordinary, and what an incredible way to transition into our message today, which is the start of a new series. This uh, next couple of weeks, uh, I don't even know exactly what to call this series other than, why do we do that? I feel like something that we've had to kind of really put a lot of thought and strategy into in the middle of COVID-19, 2020, is figuring out that which is essential versus that which is not, whether in life or in the regular goings-on of our church. And so, as we are going through the next couple of weeks, we are going to look at the most ex- essential practices of the Christian community, those who follow Jesus, what they do and how they do it. Today, we're talking about singing. Next week, about praying and giving and worship and, and, and the whole thing. So, I think that this is a good opportunity for us to really look and get kind of a whole survey of what the Bible's perspective is on these essential parts of our Christian faith. Today, we're asking the question, why do we sing? Before we get into the Word, let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that you have given us such a powerful tool as singing. Lord God, something that is for the good times and the bad times. 
something that orients our perspective around who you are and what you've done. God, I thank you that as you sing, we can reflect that. And it can mean something to us. And it can help us to grow. And it can help us to understand our circumstances. Father God, we thank you so much that you have commanded us and called us to sing. And as we look through your word to see what this looks like, why we do it, and in what circumstances we do it, God, I pray that you would lead us to see the power of this weapon, that we might do this in such a way that the whole world would hear your praise. Indeed, if the stars were made to praise you, so will we. Lead us this morning in Jesus' name, amen. I became a Christian when I was 16, and the first time I had really ever gone into a church service, the first thing I encountered in that service was singing. And everyone was sitting in rows, and everyone was looking at a screen with the words on it. And from my perspective, as previously a non-believer, I had no clue what was going on. I think that that might be a necessity for us every once in a while to think about the things we do and why we do it. Now, I caught on fairly quickly, and luckily, I had some experienced believers who were able to articulate to me the importance and the need for singing. But I kind of wish that someone would have sat me down and told me, well, this is what we do, and this is why we do it. So hopefully, as we walk through this and get kind of a whole Bible picture, albeit not exhaustive, we will see how important singing is, where it comes from, and how we can use this for God's glory. The first place that we are looking is in the Old Testament prophet Zephaniah. And this is going to be a little bit different. For the next couple weeks, the style here is going to be different than what we've seen in previous weeks. We've been pretty much choosing a text and then running through this, but we're going to be looking all over. So keep that Bible handy. Keep that Bible app handy. We're really going to be moving around a lot and kind of quickly. In the Old Testament, in Zephaniah, we're dealing with a prophet who's giving hope to the people of Israel for the future. And check out what he says in Zephaniah three seventeen. He says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. This particular verse is within a greater passage that's talking about the future restoration of people who are in exile. In the previous part of the chapter, he has told the people that salvation is not just for people who are ethnically of Israel, but anybody, Jew or Gentile, that would follow the Lord, and that God is going to do something amazing in the future to bring people together of all different cultures and languages and tongues, and he's going to bring them into community, into a family, into a body. Now, on this side of the cross, we know exactly what that looks like. That is the gospel. That is what Jesus does. does. But from this perspective, this note of hope is still looking forward to that. And I think it's incredible that right at the heart of this message is the idea that God who is with you, God who will save, he's going to do these three things when he saves you. The second half of verse 17, the first thing he's going to do, he's going to rejoice over you with gladness. We've got to resist the temptation to think that God is just some dispassionate, weird, out there, old grandpa sitting on a cloud, completely disinterested with what is happening here. When you follow the Lord, he rejoices over you with gladness. And I think the next part is really powerful as well. He will quiet you with his love. Now that's part A of a two-part thing. The next part is part B. But let's focus on that for a second. What does it mean that he will quiet you by his love? This same kind of language is used throughout the scriptures when God shows up and calms the storm. I can relate to that. In my pre-Christian walk, I didn't feel like I had purpose. 
I felt like I was being pulled in a million different directions. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I wanted. And I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. There was most definitely a storm in my life. And I feel like when Jesus broke into my soul and changed my life, I felt this in the moment that he quieted me by his love. That in the midst of that storm and the waves and the lightning, Jesus spoke into the moment and quieted my soul by expressing his love to me. But that quiet space doesn't exist for long because look at the last part of verse 17. He will exult over you with loud singing. Number one, why do we sing? Because our God sings. And we are created in his image. Singing is one of those things that is universal to every culture. It's a part of every people group. It's a natural aspect of human life. And so when we participate in this act of singing, whatever it looks like, whether it looks like the songs we do or otherwise, we engage in something that God does, that he entrusts to us, and that he does when we come to know his goodness. Know this, when you trust the Lord, there is a party going on in heaven. Because God rejoices, and it says, sings loudly when he saves. So there's our foundation. Why do we sing? Part one, because God sings. Part two, it is a natural response to coming in contact with the glory of God. Flip backwards in your Bible to the second book of the Old Testament. We're in the book of Exodus here. In Exodus chapter 15, we have just summed up the Exodus story. The people of Israel have been enslaved in Egypt. They've been persecuted for centuries. God sends Moses and mighty signs and the plagues and delivers the people out of Egypt. But they're pursued by the Egyptian army. God saves them through the Red Sea. As a result of experiencing God's salvation, the very first thing the text says is that the people begin to sing. In Exodus 15, verse 1, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Praise for the believer is spontaneous in coming into contact with God's glory, what he has done. Folks, every person sitting here is an example of a miraculous story of God breaking into time and history and through whatever means he saw fit, speaking the words of life into your heart, quieting you by his love, and then rejoicing and singing loudly as you are saved. As we continue to live, we continue to come in contact with this God's glory. I mean, these resources, this moment is an example of God's unfailing love to us. That in spite of all the crazy nonsense that's going on in this world today, we have got a God who saves. And brother, sister, that is worthy to be praised. That is worth singing about. And the most natural thing for us to do in response to discerning who God is and what he has done is to break out in song. And that's why we put so much effort into it. That's why we put so much resource into it. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say that there are a couple misconceptions about this. Our responsibility to sing because we're created in God's image and because it's our natural response to who God is and what he has done doesn't mean that it has to sound good. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. I am sometimes envious and I got to check my heart 
when I hear Maria sing and Alex sing and Miranda sing, I'm like, gosh, if I had a voice that could sing, you would be totally annoyed by it because I would do it all the time. But whether it sounds good or not is irrelevant. It's the action. And just practically, when the people of God join together, it's a way to mitigate bad singing. I remember this was, this was one of my arrogant young pastor coming of age moments. I'm just going to be honest with you. Please suspend your judgment until you hear the lesson I learned at the end. Okay? I was in an older traditional church and I was rebelling against older traditional church music. Maybe you've been there. Maybe that's part of the history of Not Avenue. I'm not sure. But my particular enemy were choirs. I just didn't see the point. And here I am going around, running my mouth, talking trash, typical, stupid, arrogant, young pastor stuff. And I remember I was just kind of flexing this argument with a senior woman at my church. And I said, you know what? If I never heard another choir, it would be too soon. And she says, Joe, can I tell you something about choirs? And I said, yeah, tell me something about choirs. And she says, I just want you to know, Joe, that I don't have a good singing voice. And that I'm very self-conscious of the fact that the people around me can more easily carry a tune, and I can't. But when I sing in that choir, and I sing a particular part, and I become a part of the greater chorus of many voices together. Where the beauty of my voice perhaps is not there, I get to be a part of something beautiful and communal that's glorifying to God. And it felt like Jesus Christ had slapped me in the face. I mean, I was humbled. And I thought, where is this arrogance coming from that because I've got a particular like and dislike of particular kinds of music, that I have the right to say to someone that the kind of music that God has put on your heart to glorify Him with and that you are vigorously and prayerfully singing with does not matter. That doesn't make sense. And that was such a coming-of-age moment for me because I realized that in singing, it's at the same time about you and not about you. It's about you in the sense that we've got a responsibility to sing. Folks, God sings and we must sing. But it's also not about you in the sense that in the incredible, beautiful diversity that God has brought among his people, it's not about what it looks like and what it sounds like. It's about the faithful hearts of those believers who are expressing their worship to our God. And just a quick flow through history makes that case incredibly. I sat down one time in a theological library and I was reading a bunch of sermons that were being preached against the devil's instrument. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. The devil's instrument, the instrument that should never, ever be used in worship music because it's only ever used in bars. It's only ever used in places of ill repute. This was not an acceptable instrument to praise our God with. These sermons were from 1690, and they were talking about the piano. I mean, we read that, and we think, how crazy is that? I mean, folks, I was just standing over here participating in our worship music and our last song being led by that driving piano about how all of creation is meant to praise our God and that singing is a part of our created purpose. And I'm like, to tell me that I can't use that particular instrument is just nonsense, Flash forward, and I'm guessing you may have at least heard of someone making that argument about a variety of other things. I want to take a really hard stand and say, who cares what instrument it is? 
Because we've got a responsibility to praise our God in whatever way that that looks like. Because God sings. And because singing is our natural response to coming in contact with God's glory. Like the Israelites did it immediately after being saved in the Exodus. So we do often, adequately, all the time. Because we recognize that our God saves. Another reason why we sing is because it is given to us for the good times and the bad times. I'm flipping all the way towards the end of the New Testament, the book of James. In James chapter 5, he's winding down his book and he's coming to the very conclusion And he's going through his last thoughts that he's going to leave the church with. The book of James has presented some big deal heavy stuff. Previously, he has said, do not only be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. In the next chapter, he said, faith without works is dead. As we wind down in chapter 5, Here is the kind of bullet point he's putting on his book. Look in chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him praise by singing. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. There's this incredible biblical parallel throughout the scripture between prayer and singing praise. A lot of times it's indistinguishable, especially in the Old Testament book of Psalms. I mean, the biggest book in our Bibles, which we're going to flip to next if you just want to kind of get that hot thumb in there and hold your place. The book of Psalms originated mostly as a bunch of prayers that were then codified in order to become songs. And that's not the only place all throughout the scriptures prayer and singing are put hand in hand. I think that if we see these as two completely different things, we need to break down that barrier and see how they often do the same thing. Prayer and singing are both about expressing the glory of God, declaring who God is and what He has done. Prayer and singing are both places where we beseech God, we ask Him to interact in our life, to intervene in our life, to work powerfully in our situations. I think that there's not so much of a difference between prayer and singing. And if so, we've got this multifaceted discipline that is for the good times and for the bad. And I think that's a powerful point. Some of the lowest times of my life, I felt my countenance recovered by a praise song that just wells up in my heart. And in the highest times, oh my gosh, that spontaneous praise is incredible. Singing praise is for all parts of life. And this biblical precedent I think, has worked itself into our regular society. I mean, there's a lot of song, there's a lot of music that takes place that's not necessarily directed towards the Lord, but has a place in our society. And I think that we do well to recognize what is good and true and beautiful. But here's something that I've noticed. If you look at a chart-topping artist who consistently has a platinum-selling song, what you'll notice is that they've got a plethora of songs that hit every emotional state. Whether it be Beyonce or Taylor Swift or the Rolling Stones. I mean, they've got a song that hits to the heart, whether you're in the high times or the low times. 
folks, that's a principle that's taken directly from the Bible in the sense that prayer and singing is meant for every part of life. When you're in despair, in the lowest of moments, and also in the height of joy and exclamation. And I think that this is why a couple weeks ago we were in the book of Colossians and Paul told us to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's a way that we communicate to each other. I know that meeting in a parking lot is weird, but folks, if there is a place where you could come and clear your heart and get things off of your chest, it's in the middle of a worship gathering where we are singing praises to our God. Whether you have a good voice or a bad voice, whether you're confident about it or not, we sing because our God sings. We sing because it is our natural reaction to coming in contact with who God is and what he has done. And we sing because it is something God has given us to do in the good times and in the bad. Finally, we sing because it is preparation for what we will do forever. This is an important point. There are many things that we do in this life that we will not do for eternity. But singing will be. I want to set the precedent first. I'm in the book of Psalms, and I'm looking in Psalms 63. It was hard to pick just a particular idea out of the book of Psalms because there's just so much content. But in Psalm 63... Verses 1 through 4, we get this incredible perspective of songs, once again, being a part of every part of our life, but looking forward as well. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. Behold, your power and glory Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. This idea of seeing God in his sanctuary and praising him for what he is, is like a shot throughout the entire biblical narrative and doesn't end when this life does. In some of the literature of the Bible, we get the perspective that there are beings in heaven whose sole purpose is to be near God and to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's a song. And if we were to flip forward to the very last chapter of Revelation, the last book in the New Testament, before John wraps up the book, the last part of the vision he sees of what heaven will look like is the people of God of all time gathered around the throne singing praises of worship to our God. When we gather together and with the multiplicity of our voices and our different perspectives, our different lives, our different identities coming together and being a part of the body of Christ, when we sing together, there is little more in this life that gives a clearer picture of what heaven will be like. We totally abuse that language. We eat a decadent chocolate cake and we say, this is like heaven. No. Somewhere that we get to see a glimpse of that future glory is when we come together and sing praises to our God. Because we see the differences melt away. We see the different backgrounds validated and brought together to know God and to declare His glory. Folks, we sing because God sings. And we're created in his image. We sing because it is our natural response to coming in contact with his glory. We sing because it's an appropriate action in the good times and in the bad. And we sing because it is practice for the eternal. 
I've intentionally kept our big idea for the end because I wanted to wrap all of that together. We sing because we are created and saved to do so. It's a part of our purpose. It's a part of our identity. We are about declaring the glory of God. And it's one of the... A couple weeks ago, we gave a similar type of sermon about baptism where we went through the New Testament and delineated what it does, what it doesn't do, why we do it. We do it because Jesus demonstrated, because he commanded it, and because it's a declaration of the gospel. Coming up in a few weeks here, we're going to have another baptism service. And as we continue to unfold this Why Do We Do It series, Hopefully by the end of our five weeks, as we are doing all of these things together, the essentials of the Christian faith, we'll see the extraordinary gift of community that God has given to us. If you have not been baptized, I want to offer an opportunity for you to think about being a part of that baptism service on the 23rd. Whereas we gather together to praise our God We not only sing about who he is and what he has done, but those who are baptized act it out. I mean, what an extraordinary way to demonstrate what God has done in our lives. When we take someone and put them under the water, it is representative of them being buried in death with Jesus in the grave. And when we pull them out, it is like they're being raised to walk new life. Baptism is an outer expression of what has already happened in their life with them following Jesus Christ. And if you have not been and have not had that opportunity with your church family to declare, this is what God has done, then I really encourage you to think about doing so. Because it's important for you and it's important for us. As we continue as a church body, in whatever circumstances it looks like, here, outside, inside, whatever that looks like, we must continue to declare the glory of God. We must sing and we must praise the God who is worthy of it. Folks, if you're not yet a believer, I want to give you an opportunity, please, to seek one of us out and talk to one of us. We may look strange, As I found it strange walking into a church the first time, seeing people sing and wondering what is the purpose, I want to tell you about the purpose of that in my life, about the God who saves and about the God who is calling you to be a part of our church family. Maybe since it's getting hot, we want to get out of this parking lot. I invite you to text the number 31996 if you've got a decision and you want to follow Jesus Christ, and especially if you're considering getting baptized, and declaring what God has done in your life. Text that number 31996, and we will follow up with you. We will come together with you. And as a church body together, we will praise the God who is worthy of being praised. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for giving us this powerful tool of singing. Thank you for demonstrating it to us, that you sing loudly when we are saved. Thank you for showing us how this is our natural response to coming in contact with who you are and what you've done. Thank you, God, for giving it to us as a tool for the good times and the bad times where we can recenter and confidently come to you knowing that you're in control. And thank you, Lord, for giving us the gift of singing to just get a little taste and a glimpse of what heaven will be like, where we get to come together and lift our voices together, many voices becoming one, praising you for who you are. Lord, we were created for this purpose. We were saved for this purpose. Help us to do so powerfully and often. We thank you, Lord, and we pray this all in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Amen, church family. If you are excited about the message, just give us a quick honk. And if you're on, on if you're at home, text beep beep and we would love to be excited with you guys as well we want to thank you church family for those who are in the car those who are at home and those who are at the apartments we just want to just thank you for showing up today and one of the things that i love to to say when i think about worship i always say is that worship is prayer turned into music and i love the big idea where it says we must sing because we are created and saved to do so you know, one of the things is that when we sing, we always sing because it's a happy time. But one of the things that we have to understand, church family, is this, is that we need to sing, oh, happy day, no matter how the day is going. Why? It's because this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen, church? Amen, amen. One of the exciting things that uh, you guys get to participate in and for those who are at home is, is an act of worship is the, the way that we give here at this church. A lot of great things that we do at the church. Uh, as a student ministry, as a student pastor, I was able to do a month-long uh, student ministry here on our campus. And about two weeks ago, we had what we call Christ in Youth at KACC. And because of your great giving and your great support of our church, uh, we were able to put on this three-day event. And there was a lot of things that were happening. We had 21 rededications. Amen. We had... We had four first-time uh, response to the gospel, first-time believers, and six, and six baptisms. So I want to introduce to you two of the students that was here during that time. Come up over here, you guys. So as I said, two weeks ago when we had our Christ in Youth, we had one student, Batelli, uh, not only give up her life, give her life to the Lord, but was also baptized on that day. Last week, we also had our, what we call our summer send-off. It is our beach party, our beach send-off, right before the kids go back to school. And Quentin over here got baptized last Thursday at the beach. So church family, I want to just thank you for allowing me and my staff to do what we do with our, our students. And at the same time, if you don't know how to give, there's, there's three ways to give. There's push pay, there is a check that you can mail in, or you could drop it off anytime during the week, Monday through Thursday. But church family, we just want to just celebrate. You know, one of the things that I remember a, a, a guy that got, I was so excited after a message. I remember a guy comes up to me, and it felt like what he said to me was a wet blanket over me like because I was so excited about that message and he looked to me and I and I realized after he said it I realized it wasn't a wet blanket it was an encouragement he says to me Albert a good message isn't a good message unless you act upon it so church family as we talk about baptism as we talk about people accepting Jesus for the very first time for if we talk about uh, students rededicating their life what are they saying is that they're going to live Live in obedience. So church family, as you go from this place, have a blessed day and let's live out the gospel each and every day. So have a good Sunday church family and we hope to see you next week.